Test it. Well, good evening. We want to welcome you back to our evening service tonight. Uh, we're going to have a little fun with this one. Here we go. Well, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cry. Answer by and by. Feel a little prayer will turn in. Know a little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears. a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. He knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cry. Answer by and by. Feel a little prayer will turn in. Know a little fire is burning. With Jesus makes it Could not keep him rising up. 
Well, good evening and welcome again to Ozark Baptist Church. We are glad uh, that you're here. Uh, thanks again to uh, Brother Matt and Carmen uh, for the wonderful music, some old hymns done a different way. And boy, I like that uh, Carmen and Matt have been faithful. Like so many of our people during this whole pandemic, uh, they've hung in here with me and uh, led music and, and led worship. And boy, I appreciate that. Appreciate all of our people that have been faithful, and I'm glad that you're tuning in uh, tonight to uh, listen to the service. I want to remind us, uh, this coming Sunday, uh, May the 31st, we'll have online Sunday school at uh, uh, 10 a.m. and then uh, online preaching at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. And then if the Lord tarries is coming... Uh, we're making plans, but God may come back and get us and we all be gone anyway. Uh, but we're making plans for Sunday, June the 7th. Uh, we're trying to look at a way to do, uh, uh, do another corporate Sunday school, online Sunday school for you. Uh, but what we're suggesting, if you feel comfortable, and, and let me just say, all this is subject to change. Uh, I'm glad that we don't have to do what everybody else has done. As a matter of fact, we don't have to do anything uh, anybody else does other than what God tells us to do. Uh, and so in any of these services, as we begin back, we're coming back. Uh, and uh, when we come back, uh, if you do not feel comfortable coming, if you're sick, there will be some things posted and, and sent out to you to let you just know uh, in time. Uh, but that Sunday morning, June the 7th, at uh, 9 a.m., we'll have a service in the old sanctuary. And uh, we're saying at about 60 and above, and those that maybe have some health issues, you'll meet over there, and uh, we'll have time uh, to come over here at 11, and then 11 uh, a.m. we'll have uh, all worshipers here. Uh, I've never liked, uh, liked Carmen, the, the, the term social distancing. Uh, that sounds like an oxymoron. How can you be social and distant? Uh, so we will be practicing physical distancing uh, every other pew, and uh, I realize that set, uh, cuts down on our seating capacity. Uh, but we'll probably plan in the 11 o'clock for sure uh, to have an uh, overflow room uh, in the uh, uh, fellowship hall uh, because everybody agrees, although they don't agree on everything, everybody agrees uh, that uh, seven days is ample time uh, for, uh, for this thing to die. We want, we're not using the same buildings. There'll be a week's time between the buildings. Uh, deep cleaning will be done before, as a matter of fact, it starts tomorrow. 
Uh, I've had the pr- pleasure and privilege, as Brother Matthew had, the last several weeks are, are, are preaching to pictures. All the pictures have been taken taken out. Uh, all the pews have been, I mean, all the um, hymn books have been removed from the back of the pews just to get a good uh, cleaning around, and so that will start. So I tell you what, we're coming back. We're coming back safely, and I'm excited about it. I just pray I don't have a heart attack when I see y'all the first time. Amen. Take your Bibles tonight and be found in the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 13. I'm preaching tonight on the subject, a message you can't afford to ignore. A message you can't afford to ignore when you turn to the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 13. In the first nine verses, you recognize that this is a, a parable about the sower. Not only is it a parable about the sower, but it's also a parable about the seed. And so tonight, if you'd like to stand in reverence to the reading of the Word of God, Matthew 13 and verse 1, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto Him. So He went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stro- stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. Verse 6, And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because uh, they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good, into good ground and brought forth fruit. Now watch this. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And then the Lord closes this parable by saying, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Thanking you may be seated as we pray together tonight. Father, bless the reading of the Word of God. Bless the preaching of it. God, help us to heed it. Hear it and honor it. And God will thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Sometimes uh, when, when you uh, listen to a TV or a radio preacher, uh, they will often make this statement. And I quote, you need to get a copy of this message. I'm talking about this is the greatest message that you'll ever hear. And sometimes that may be true. Sometimes it may not be true. It's not true for me because I've never ordered any, any of that. But they may be right. So I'm not saying tonight that this is the greatest message you'll ever hear. But what I am saying tonight is this. This is a message you can't afford to miss. Uh, because it talks about something very important your soul, it talks about the seed being the Word of God. And so if you're here tonight and heed uh, the truths that are revealed by Jesus in this parable, boy, they're life-altering. They are life-changing truths that Jesus lays before us on this Sunday night. And so it's my prayer that you'll listen prayerfully and you'll listen carefully tonight to this one message. You cannot afford to ignore. First of all, I want to say the task of the sower. Now the scripture said a sower went forth to sow. Now I'm not trying to be funny at the very uh, introduction of the first part, but let me tell you, that's what a sower does. Sowers sow. A sower goes forth to sow just like preachers are supposed to preach. Uh, That's what we ought to do, and that's what I try to do. I just preach and preach and preach because that's what I'm supposed to do. Preachers are to preach, singers are to sing. It's pretty simple when you you do it like that. So the task of the sower, knows with me his identity. In the parable is a farmer, and the Bible says that he is broadcasting seeds into a field. In other words, there is a meditated uh, plan, uh, a program of broadcasting the seeds. Some sometimes uh, you would just. Uh, I'll throw the seeds out, I guess. And maybe some of you tonight, as you listen to the message, you have a, 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 a picture of a Johnny Apple seed, a, a seed spreader. And can you just see this guy out there sowing seeds or whatever? Anyway, a, a, a sower, the scripture says, are you with me? Goes forth to sow seeds, and he's sowing, he's sowing uh, these seeds. His identity, according to, to Jesus' interpretation in Mark, 4 and 14, the the sower sows the Word of God. 
That's why I'm telling you, this is a message unlike any other message. You cannot afford to ignore it. And now, I like watermelon. I like a lot of things that come out of the earth. But let me tell you something. There's no seed like the Word of God. There, there's no seed when the Word of God, there's no seed like the Word of God when the Word of God is planted and it grows up in a person's a life. And the Bible refers to that seed as the Word of God. We don't sow politics here. I don't preach politics. We don't sow religion here. We sow the Word of God. Because politics is not going to change you. Religion is not going to change you. But the Word of God is going to change you. So the sower that is sowing what he should sow, he will sow the Word of God. That is the sower's identity. Now the sower's intentions, as we continue to read, the farmer sows. Why? Because he's hoping and praying that some of the seeds will fall on good ground. He realizes that, that all of them's not going to come up. Uh, I heard one time about a, about a preacher uh, talking to uh, uh, D.L. Moody, and D.L. Moody said to him, the preacher was lamenting the fact that not a lot of people got saved. And, and uh, Moody looked at the young preacher and he said, uh, Well, son, you don't think somebody's going to get saved every time you preach, do you? And, and the little preacher said, No. Moody says, That's your problem. You ought to believe when you sow the Word of God, it's not because you're a good speaker, it's not because you're a good preacher, but there's power, wonder-working power in the Word of God. And when the Word of God is, it is preached, people will be saved. And so he sows seeds with a high expectancy. He sows more than he, 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 he hopes to reap. But, and he's going he's gonna to reap later than he sows. The day he sows, the seeds are not going to come up that afternoon. I mean, he's not going to plan and then come back two hours later and be able to gather it. We find that in the Word of God. Some people are sowers. Some people are harvesters. The, harvesters. the Bible says that, that one man plants, one man waters, and, and, but God gives the increase. And so maybe you're a seed sower. And there's no shame in being a seed sower. Seeds don't get to be plants unless they're sown. Somebody has to sow them and water them with prayers and water them with tears. It's, it's sometimes a very thankless job, but the plant will not grow. The Word of God will not germinate unless somebody sows the seed for it to do so. And as a matter of fact, when I sow, that's my desire. That's my desire. And I tell you what, the Lord uh, does, does a lot of different things, Matt, to teach you uh, humbleness and grace. And, and uh, hey, listen, people don't have to be here to be saved. People don't have to be here to... to, to uh, 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 walk down this aisle. I know that we got a lot of people watching. And, and, and let me tell you something. You can be saved in your living room. You can be saved as this sower tonight, as I'm sowing the seed, which is the Word of God. You can be saved on your couch tonight and just be as saved as you were sitting on a church pier. Because that is, that is the intention of the sower. His identity is he's sowing the precious seeds. His intention is the seeds will come up. Now watch his investment, the sower's investment. Now he's got to give something away before he can get something in return. And boy, that's what our heavenly sower God did, wasn't he? he? He gave his best, the Lord Jesus Christ, his own darling son, that, that we may be saved. And, and boy, I'm glad today that the salvation we preach at this church is not a salvation of works, but it's a salvation of grace. But it is because a faith that works in the Lord Jesus Christ. We preach that Jesus died for everybody, that whosoever will may come, that God commended his love toward you. You, that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. The gospel is relevant. It is essential. It is available for all people that will come and receive it. But in order for people to receive the gospel, friend, you've got to preach the gospel. A lot of this stuff that people are preaching, hey, you've got to preach the gospel in order to get people saved. 
He gave it all for, for this soul. And, and boy, I'm glad we got a life changing, life believing gospel, don't you? I'm glad that we got a gospel that's, that we can preach and we can teach, but also we can believe. And so tonight, first of all, that is the task of the, of the sower. Now, let me say this before I move on to point two. If you are a Christian, then you are a sower. We have the idea mistakenly so that uh, uh, staff and pastors and evangelists are, are our paid hired gun soul winners. We're not. We're not hirelings. If you're saved, it's your job to get off your blessed assurance and tell somebody about Jesus. That's your job. Because you're going to give account of the judgment seat of Christ whether or not you were faithful as a soul winner and received the soul winner's crown. It's your job. It's not the preacher's job altogether. We are to be soul winners and give our faith away. But nobody knows your story better than you. So quit making excuses and start telling it. Here's the second thing. The treasure of the seed. And Luke uh, 8, 11, again, Jesus identifies the seed as the Word of God. I can't emphasize that enough. It's not the j- job of the church to clothe everybody that's naked. That's one of the things we do. But it's not our main job. It's not the job of the church to feed everybody that's hungry. It's not the job of the church even to give out money to everybody that can't pay their gas bill or their electric bill. Now, I believe there's a benevolent ministry here that we're very active in. But let me tell you something. The number one job of the church is to preach the gospel. The number one job of the church is to lift up Christ so people can come to know Jesus. Their stomach may have to be ministered to before you minister to to their heart. And so the treasure of the seed is when the farmer walks into the field. Get this picture. It's very vivid. When the farmer walks into the field, he has a special, a very valued treasure. That's the seed. That's his income. That's how his family's going to survive. That's how he's going to make his living. There is a treasure in that pouch called the seed. Can I tell you something? 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ walked into this world with a treasure, with a sure knowledge that if you receive Him and the seed of the Word of God was received in in your life, then He would accomplish His purpose. Somebody said, why Jesus come? Jesus came for a double mission. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost and friend his word will not return void we need to preach it we need to practice it we need to live it we need to quit arguing it and and debating it we just need to preach the word of God now let me talk to you about this the treasures of this word it holds great power number one life giving power the soul is devoid of power before the seeds planted. Think about that. So was your life and so was my life before we trusted Jesus. We were dead dirt, so to speak. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. We were, we were a soil that was not very fertile because the Holy Spirit hadn't plowed it yet. And when the Holy Spirit plowed it, and then the Word of God was, was, was thrown in as a, as a precious uh, seed. Uh, th- then there's great power, life-giving power. Living, He loved me, they sang about. Dying, He saved me. Rising, He justified. Oh, listen, it has great power power in your life when the word of God is applied to the situation it's great power it's a great treasure but the second thing not only is a great power it holds great promise it holds great promise now the seed the sower uh, sows has potential uh, to produce more seed it, it, it's wonderful in, in what he says listen to verse 8 did you catch it when we read the text together but other fell onto good ground and brought forth some bought forth fruit excuse me some a hundredfold you see that some 60 fold some 30 fold one little old tired seed has the potential to multiply in itself 3000 percent then 6000 percent then 10,000 percent one little old seed 
hey, what would happen if, well, preacher, we're just one little old church. Hey, quit, quit, uh, quit basing the success on your ministry on the size of your church. The size of your church, preacher, has nothing to do with the success and the scope of your ministry. You just preach the Word. Be in season, out of season, and realize that it holds great power, but also it has great potential. The more times you preach it, the more the law of averages will catch you. Hey, listen. When a farmer plants, he don't drop just one watermelon seed in, does he? <laughs> Boy, I'm hoping to have a field of watermelon. That's one seed. All right, come on, field. No. He, he, he mounds it up and he, he, he puts in several. Search, search the, uh, such is the gospel when it's, when it's sown in a ready heart. It will germinate. It will reproduce itself over and over and over again. And so, friend, let me tell you something. There's, there, there's great power in the treasure of the seed. There, there's great promise in the treasure of the seed. Now, let me show you uh, the, the last thing tonight. Not only the task of the sower and the treasure of the seed, but watch this. The testimony of the souls. You know, a lot of people will call this the parable of the souls or the parable of the sower. But, but I want you to see the soils in which the seed is sown. First of all, there's the compacted soil, I call it. Look in verse number 4, And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Seeds on the side uh, of, the, of the row there, and the birds came by and eat them, is what he's saying. Wayside, what's that talking about? That's talking about, that was the roads of their day. Uh, uh, it was almost like concrete. Uh, bare feet and sandals had beat it down. And, and boy, it was hard. It was not, not a conducive uh, surface in order to plant seeds. As a matter of fact, those of you in our congregation, a lot of you have beautiful gardens this time of the year and, and, and planting your gardens and, and uh, uh, have flower beds and all this kind of stuff. But very seldom, if ever, have I heard anybody in any congregation that I pastor say to me, Preacher, I've got a rock garden. Give me some seeds. And let me go plant them in the rock garden. You say, don't be facetious. You're trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm telling you, seeds don't grow in a rock garden. And that's why the Bible says it, it, it fell among a stone, fell by the wayside. It refers to a person who has heard the gospel but doesn't respond. Their heart may be so hard that they, they, they uh, think the gospel is foolish and they don't want to believe and they said yes and, and yes and, 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 and excuse me no and no and no and no and, and then they can't say yes because that gospel that's why it's good I mean it's not impossible for an older person to be saved but that's why it's good that you give your heart to Jesus while you're young while your soil's still ready to be plowed, why, why it's still fertile, why you, you, your heart's not crusted over and you're not mean and cantankerous as you, and you haven't grown older and colder, but you're listening to the gospel and you can be saved, the compacted soil. But then number two is a crippled soil. In verses five and six, some fell among stony places where they had not much earth, and forth where they sprung up because they had no deepness in the earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because uh, they had no root, they withered away. Now, now what's that mean? Stony places were very common in Palestine. Uh, if you know anything about the Bible land. It, it, it refers to those. I want to be very careful from this point on in the message. Uh, because I don't want to appear to be judgmental. But uh, it refers to those who have had an emotional experience, but they've never had a salvation experience. I've seen some folks that get so emotional uh, at the very uh, thought of salvation, Carmen, you thought they was about to grow a, a halo and sprout wings. And then the FBI couldn't find them for the next month. And they wanted to join the church and they wanted to do this. And, and, and listen, friend, let me tell you something. There may be emotion in you getting saved, but, but emotion is the shallowest part of your being. Salvation is the deepest part of God's work. God's not going to do the deepest part of His work in the shallowest part of your being. 
There may be some heart in it, but there better be some head in it. And that's why you don't come to Jesus uh, a head first. You come to Jesus' heart first. And, and, and boy, will they really say, look at the fruit. If they keep trying this old stuff, they're going back to the old stuff. Hey, people do what they do because they are what they are. You take somebody has been born again. I'm talking about they're not perfect. They're just purchased. But they're not going to go back to the same address and do the same thing and, and visit the same old places of amusement. They're going to be changed and they're going to be some spiritual fruit because there's a, a spiritual root that's been set down. If the Lord saves you, let me tell you something, Look, come up close. If the Lord has saved you, He's changed you. There is the compacted soul, the crippled soul, and then the crowded soul. Verse, uh, verse number 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. I don't know in this community if anybody else is growing weeds, but I, I got a weed garden, amen. I didn't intend to have a weed garden supposed to be a flower bed, but it seems like if you neglect it and if you don't have enough roundup, <laughs> the weeds will take over. And that's exactly what happened here. And you know the picture. We're, we're country people. Uh, we are Most of our congregation, a lot of them are farmers. You know the picture better than I do. Weeds have choked down the good thing. I mean, you, you set out to grow the good thing, but the weeds have, have taken, it pictures a, a person that wants the benefit of the gospel, but yet they try to deny their old sin's life, and they still live like they're sinners. They just come to church on Sunday, and, and, and they're nothing more than a baptized pagan because they live like the world, they drink like the world, uh, they, they mess around like the world, uh, they cuss like the world, and why? Because they're of the world. And the Bible says, Come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord God of hosts. And so while God returns, demands repentance and faith, salvation can come only after that. You've got to repent and you've got to have, have faith in Christ and then salvation can be realized. And let me show you the, the, uh, the last soul tonight and that is the choice soul. That's the one we want. Verse number 8, But other fell uh, into good ground and brought forth uh, fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. It's a picture of a heart, beautiful, that's been plowed by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God has been, been planted. And I tell you what, any person that turns to Jesus is good soul. And then there, there, this is a reference to to a, to a saved person, of, of course, that person that trusts Jesus. And so what kind of fruit does God produce in your life when you get saved? Well, just, just, just three simple things. First of all, sanctification. We, we, will, we will be like Him. Romans 6, 22 says, But now, being free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit uh, unto holiness, and the end is everlasting life. You sanctify that, that, that by the washing of the, uh, of the Word uh, to your life. That's what Jesus, that's the fruit that Jesus wants to bring about. He wants to bring about the fruit of, of sanctification. Then secondly, Jesus wants to bring about the fruit of spirituality. You look in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 and 23, you've got the fruits of the Spirit. And by the way, God wants fruits of the Spirit from His church. He don't want a bunch of religious nuts. He wants the fruits of the Spirit. Love, gentleness, temperance, patience, self-control, the fruits of the Spirit. And then number three, not only does He want to produce the fruit of sanctification and the fruit of spirituality, but He wants to produce the fruit of more souls. We'll become burdened. For souls, for people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse number 13. Listen to what the Word of God says in Romans 1 and, and 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have come, had some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. We're going to love what Jesus loved. And Jesus not only loved the church, but He loved the souls. And so which soul tonight describes your heart? Is your heart uh, 
calloused? Is it hard? Is it stony? Is it thorny? Not trying to make you doubt your salvation tonight, but somebody just casually maybe listening to this and God says, stop because you need to hear this. Hey, you've never been saved, and you, you, you know, you, you, and then families sometimes we prop them up on this, and all we're doing is just making a good avenue to, to, to uh, go to hell from. Listen to this. Here's the caution. Don't tell the person they're saved because you were there. Hey, listen, they're the only one that knows. Amen? They're the only one that knows. Don't be some type of religious crutch that says, Oh, we were at church when you got baptized. Oh, we were there. We were this and that. Hey, listen. If they are not sure, then they're not sure. And you can't talk them into hell uh, because you're telling them they need to be sure. Maybe you've heard the message tonight and, and, and your heart's been stirred. And On this Sunday night, you've never trusted Jesus, but you'd like to. Let me tell you something. Jesus will save you. And that's why I'm telling you tonight, if you'll repent of your sins and trust Jesus, Jesus Christ will save you and He will always keep you saved. And that, my friend, is a message you can't afford to miss. Let's pray together. As Brother Matt comes, I've said it every time, most important time of the service is the invitation. What about you at home tonight? What are you going to do with Jesus? I'm going to pray and then Brother Matt's going to sing a, a line or two of, of this uh, uh, invitation hymn. But what's God talked to you about? What kind of heart do you have? What kind of soul is your soul? Almost sounds like the same word, doesn't it? Soul, soul. Soul, soul. Father, I pray tonight that you'll speak to somebody. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. It's our prayer on behalf of Ozark Baptist Church tonight that uh, you know that you need Jesus. The greatest need that we have is to admit that we need Jesus. If you made a decision for Christ or if you would like to make a decision for Christ, the numbers are on the board, the numbers from our uh, church office and then our personal cell phones uh, of pastor and associate pastor are up there. And so if you'd like to call, want somebody to talk to you today, tomorrow, or whenever, uh, then just give us a buzz. Hope you have a, a happy, happy Memorial Day tomorrow. Have a good time with your family. Don't eat too much, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the message tonight. Thank you for the music. And Father, I pray that it'll find lodging in the soil of somebody's soul. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.